all the uh, devotees are waiting for your class, Maharaj. Uh-huh. So, Dr. Maharaj, it's a small offering to you, Maharaj. Oh, thank you very much, very kind. So, in a short while, we'll start the class, Maharaj. Okay. Okay, Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vancha Kaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare So we're going to read from the Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 6, which is Dhyana Yoga, text number 5. Odarat Atman Atmanam Natmanam Avashadhayat Atmaiva Hi Atmano Budhir Atmaiva Ripur Atmanaha Udarat, one must deliver Atmana by the mind Atmanam the conditioned soul Na, never. Atmanam, the conditioned soul. Avasadayat, put into degradation. Atma, mind. Eva, certainly. He, indeed. Atmanaha, of the conditioned soul. Bandhu, friend. Atma, mind. Eva, certainly. Ripu, an enemy, Atmanaha, of the conditioned soul. Translation One must deliver himself with the help of his mind and not degrade himself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy as well. Purport by his Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. The word Atma denotes body, mind and soul, depending upon different circumstances. In the yoga system, the mind and the conditioned soul are especially important. Since the mind is the central point of yoga practice, Atma refers here to the mind. The purpose of the yoga system is to control the mind and to draw it away from attachment to sense objects. It is stressed herein that the mind must be so trained that it can deliver the conditioned soul from the mire of, from the mire of nations. In material existence, one is subjected to the influence of the mind and the senses. In fact, the pure soul is entangled in the material world because the mind is involved with the false ego, 
which desires to lord it over material nature. Therefore the mind should be trained so that it will not be attracted by the glitter Therefore the mind should be trained so that it will not be attracted by the glitter of material nature, and in this way the conditioned soul may be saved. One should not degrade oneself by attraction to sense objects. The more one is attracted by sense objects, the more one becomes entangled in material existence. The best way to disentangle oneself is to always engage the mind in Krishna consciousness. The word he is used for emphasizing this point, that one must do this. It is also said, Mam eva manushyanam karanam bandhu mokshaya bandhaya vishaya sango mukjya nirvishayam manaha for man, mind is the cause of bondage, and mind is the cause of liberation. Mind absorbed in sense objects is the cause of bondage, and mind detached from the sense objects is the cause of liberation. From the Amrita Bindu Upanishad number 2. Therefore, the mind which is always engaged in Krishna consciousness is the cause of supreme liberation. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhai Evacha Patitanam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavanda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare. Translation again. One must deliver himself with the help of his mind and not degrade himself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy as well. We may be puzzled when we hear this for the first time. How could something be the friend and at the same time the enemy? Well, that is the nature of the mind. It depends on how we use it. Some things can be good and some, the same thing in the hands of someone else may be very bad. We give the example like a knife can be used by a doctor to heal the doctor may have to cut and, or lance some infected area and he may use a knife to do it. But the same knife may be, may be used by some criminal, by some uh, very evil-minded person to, to kill or to wound someone. So everything depends on the attitude which we have. At that point is made in the preface of the Nectar of Instruction by Srila Prabhupada. He said, everything depends on the attitude of the disciple or the attitude of the yogi. As In this case, we're talking about yoga, the chapter 6, Dhyana Yoga. Lord Krishna is describing about Astanga Yoga particularly. And in the practice of Astanga Yoga, it's very important that one can control the mind because one will have to sit and concentrate the mind. 
So Lord Krishna describes how the mind can be both the friend or the enemy. If the mind is controlled, it's a friend. But if the mind is not controlled, it's the enemy. It's the enemy because it will cause our degradation. It will simply become absorbed in thinking of the sense objects. The, in the mind, we contemplate sense objects. We contemplate things which are pleasing to our senses. Something should have a nice smell, it should be very attractive looking, it should make a nice sound, it should, uh, it should be very powerful and strong. Like this, what is pleasing to the sense objects? We have five senses. There are five sense objects, uh, sound, oh, well, so hearing, touching, uh, tasting, smelling and seeing. We want to be careful of becoming absorbed in the senses and thinking what is pleasing to our senses. We don't want to take too ple great pleasure in the senses and we also don't want to go the other extreme and be overly disgusted with the senses. There's an example of that in relation to the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, how he met with Sanatana Goswami at Jagannath Puri. Lord Chaitanya was residing in Jagannath Puri and Sanatana Goswami had come from Vrindavan to meet him. And Sanatana Goswami had come through the forests and he'd been drinking water which was not very pure. Going through a forest, you, 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 he couldn't get proper water to drink. So he drank some water which was uh, contaminated or impure and the result was his, he suffered a a skin problem. His skin became very diseased and had developed many sores over his body. But Lord Chaitanya would come and embrace him. So Sanatana Goswami felt very guilty about this, that Lord Chaitanya is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and he's completely pure and he's coming and he's touching my body and my body is diseased and contaminated because there were many sores over his body and the sores were oozing liquid, poisonous fluids was coming out from his body. But Lord Chaitanya did not care, he would come and embrace him. So Sanatana Goswami felt very bad about this, but Lord Chaitanya chastised Sanatana Goswami and he told Sanatana Goswami, that you should understand that for someone who is a, a devotee and particularly someone who is a sannyasi like Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who is in the renounced order of life, then their mind should be equipoised. It's an important quality of a devotee, a Vaishnava. We shouldn't think something very good and we should not also think something very bad. Sanatana Goswami was thinking his body was very bad, it was very diseased and contaminated. And he was even contemplating suicide. But Lord Chaitanya told him, this is not good, this is not proper, this is not the thinking of a devotee. The devotees of the Lord will be equipoised in their mind. The nature, unfortunately, in conditioned life, the nature of the mind is to make distinction. And we think, I like this, I don't like that. This person is my friend and that person is my enemy. We are seeing everything 
on the bodily platform, in material vision. We make distinctions like this. And this is conditioned life. This is not Krishna consciousness. In Krishna consciousness, we have to recognize everything in relation to Lord Krishna. We see everything in relation to Krishna. Something is good, it's the arrangement of Krishna. And something is very bad, it's also the arrangement of Krishna. Hmm. Prabhupada gives the example, he said, uh, God is like someone with ten arms. If they want to give something, they can give so much. We only have two arms, but the Lord has ten arms. And if he wants to give something, he can give so much. And if the Lord wants to take also, well, he has ten arms, we only have two. He can take everything from us. Therefore, a devotee of the Lord remains surrendered to the will of the Lord. What is the desire of Lord Krishna? That is important. It's not what we want. It's not what we like. We have to see in everything there's the hand of the Supreme Lord. What is his desire? And we have to accept his desire as supreme. That is Krishna consciousness. However, our minds are the greatest enemy. They get very entangled and attached to different situations, various conditions and so on. We're always thinking, I like this, I don't like that. This is very good, oh that is very bad. Thinking like that, this is not the duty of a devotee, the Vaishnavas. Their minds must be equipoised. We don't make distinction, good or bad, friend or enemy. We see everything as the plan of Lord Krishna. Prabhupada talked about his own spiritual master. Now, the spiritual master was often invited to go to different places. And he would say, yes, I will come there by the grace of Krishna. Or he would say, if Krishna wills, then it will happen. We will do it. Like that. He would always, he would always present the desire of Lord Krishna as being the prominent factor. It's not just what we want or what we're going to do. We have to understand our position that we are simply the insignificant servants of Lord Krishna. And our duty is to fulfill his desires and cooperate with his plan. Krishna has a plan for all of us and we just simply have to surrender to his plan. That is the idea. Lord Krishna is, we say, Ishwara Parama Krishna, Satchit Ananda Vigraha, Anadir Adir Govinda, Sarva Karana Karanam. Lord Krishna is the Supreme Controller and he has an eternal blissful form. He is the cause of all causes and the origin of all origins. So, Sarva Karana Karanam, he's the cause of everything. We are not the cause. We are just simply the instruments. And our position is to become an instrument in his service. This is described also in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. The 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita means the universal form. So in that chapter, Lord Krishna is instructing Arjuna what his mental condition should be while taking part in the battle of Kurukshetra. Lord Krishna tells Arjuna, Nimita matra bhava savya sachin. 
he says he he addresses Arjuna as Savya Sachin, meaning he's very expert in archery. He of course, Arjuna has a Gandiva bow. So he's famous for carrying the Gandiva bow and he has many different astras or weapons which he can release. And he's very powerful with that bow. Therefore, Lord Krishna is telling Arjuna, you just become an instrument in my service. Lord Krishna showed to Arjuna Kalarup. He showed him how all the soldiers who were going to take part in the battle, they were all going to die. Bhishma, Drona, and all the Kauravas, and practically everyone except for the Pandavas, they were all going to die in the battle of Kurukshetra. Lord Krishna had arranged for that battle to take place just to remove all of these unwanted all of these people who were actually inimical or they were opposed to the plan of the Lord. Lord Krishna comes to establish dharma, to establish religiosity. And in order to establish real religion, he has to remove all of those who are opposed to it. And there were many demoniac kings who were overburdening the earth planet. Therefore, Lord Krishna arranged the battle of Kurukshetra. And during that battle, all of the different offenders were removed. There were many offenders. They had offended, for example, Mother uh, Queen Draupadi. They had tried to disrobe her and to make her naked in front of an assembly of so many of these kings. Of course, Lord Krishna protected her by coming as her inexhaustible sari. But Lord Krishna arranged for all of these different people who had been involved in this sinful activity that they all had to die. And they all assembled at Kurukshetra and they all killed each other. That was the result. They all met their death. So Lord Krishna, even before the battle, he showed that to Arjuna. He showed Arjuna the Kala Rup, the universal form, his form of time. And Arjuna could see everyone entering into his mouths and being killed. Everyone except for the Pandavas. Because they were the surrendered devotees. They were working in cooperation with the plan of the Lord. Lord Krishna arranges for everyone according to their pious and sinful activities. They get the results, each and every one. We have to understand, therefore, the importance of working in cooperation with the plan of the Lord. And the plan of the Lord is, in this Kali Yuga, he wants his holy name distributed. The chanting of the Maha Mantra is very important. It is stated in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Kaler doshani de rajan astihi eko mahadguna kirtanad eva krishnashya mukta sangha saman, saman brajit that the age of Kali, it's Kaler dosha nide, dosha, fault. The, in the Kali Yuga, it's an ocean of faults. There are so many faults in this Kali Yuga. This was described in the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam. In the very first, first chapter, the sages of Naimasharanya were putting questions to Sutta Goswami and they were describing the Kali Yuga, how uh, everyone has a short life and they're lazy and they're unlucky and they're misguided and they're always disturbed. And these are the qualities of people in the Kali Yuga. Or we could say these are the disqualifications of people in the Kali Yuga. 
what to do about it. So in the 11th canto Srimad Bhagavatam, we're told what to do about it. That although the age of Kali is an ocean of faults, though there is one good thing about it. And the, the good thing about it is that simply by chanting the holy name of the Lord, one can get all success, all perfection. Lord Chaitanya therefore comes in the Kali Yuga to teach everyone how to get peace of mind, how to get free from all the anxieties of the material life, simply by chanting His holy name. This is the process for actually controlling the mind and bringing the mind to the higher platform. Conditioned life in conditioned life, the mind is busy simply thinking of sense gratification. We're thinking about eating and sleeping, mating and defending. We're simply planning for the enjoyment of the material body. But on the higher platform, one will think about his spiritual position. One will understand himself not simply as a body with senses, but one will think of himself as a soul, and he will think about the need of the soul. The soul needs to connect with the Supreme Soul. This is achieved in the Kali Yuga only by chanting the holy name. In the Kali Yuga there is no other way but to chant the holy name. We want to control the mind, you have to chant the holy name. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu quoted the Vedic verse, Harinama Harinama Eva Kevalam Kaloa Nesteva 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 Gatir Anyata. This is Kali Santara Upanishad. That in the Kali Yuga, there's no other way, no, he says it, three, no other way, no other way, just to emphasize, to convince us that there's no other way but to chant the holy name. We want to control the mind, the mind will find shelter in the lotus feet of Krishna. And we can approach the lotus feet of Krishna through the chanting of the holy name. The mind can become the friend. We have to train it. Just like in, in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna was describing yoga to Arjuna. And Arjuna was saying, oh, I can't do this. My mind is restless. My mind is unstable. My mind is worse than, than the wind. But Lord Krishna told him, Lord Krishna said, Asam Shayam Mahabaho. Manu Durni Graham Chalam Abhya Sena Chukonteya Vairagena Chakriyate. Lord Krishna is saying, It's undoubtedly difficult, Arjuna, but it is possible. And what is required? Abhyas, practice, vairag, detachment. These two things are required. We have to practice chanting the holy name. And we have to cultivate detachment, detachment from the material, detachment from whatever is not in relation to our mood of Krishna consciousness. Practice. Yeah. It, we should understand that we've been in the material world for a very long time. We are conditioned. We're called nitya badas. It means eternally conditioned, not in the sense that there's no that there's no way out. But the point is, it's nitya in the sense that we've been here so long that we don't remember when we came here. So we're eternally conditioned. So we've been here so long, we've forgotten when when we came in this world. Therefore, it's going to take some time to recover our real pure consciousness. 
The mind is meant to be pure, but due to contact with the material energy, becomes covered. We forget our actual spiritual position and we identify instead with matter. We identify with this body and this body means the senses and we, we think about enjoying the senses. We think about filling the belly, we think about sleeping, we think about whatever is pleasing, we think it will be pleasing to our mind and senses. We have to understand these things are not actually so pleasing to the mind, but it's the illusion, this, we have the illusion that we're happy. This is the problem, just like in a dream, it's an illusion, it's not real. In the same way, we have the illusion that we're finding happiness in these material pleasures. Actually, they're not really pleasures. They're actually just another aspect of our suffering in the material world. We want to get out of this conditioned state of existence. And to do that, we have to take the help from the Supreme Lord. We have to take shelter of His holy name, loudly chanting His holy name with great determination and faith, understanding that the Lord is not different from His name. The Lord is His name. When we approach the Lord through His name, the result is our mind will become pacified we'll feel relief from all the material desires. That is the wonder of the Holy Name. Chanting of the Holy Name means we will, we will want to have more tongues to chant and more ears with which to hear the Holy Name. And when the Holy Name actually enters into our heart, then it conquers the activities of the mind and all the senses become inert. That is real chanting of the Holy Name. We're not, it's not just some sound vibration which comes on the tongue. The Holy Name actually comes from the spiritual world. We say, Golo Kera Primadan Harinam Sankirtan. The chanting of the Holy Name descends from Goloka, and it's full of prem, it's full of love of God. We want to develop a little inkling, some taste for this chanting of the Holy Name. And in this way, our mind will find relief from all the tension, all the anxieties which we carry in our mind. The biggest enemy to us is the mind. There was a nice example of this given to me, uh, I will just recount. Devotee was telling me, he said, there, there was one man, he got stuck inside a big walk-in ref refrigerator. And he was inside this refrigerator and somehow somebody closed the door and he couldn't get out. And somehow, Nobody knew he was inside the refrigerator and he was left there the whole night. And so he thought that he's in the refrigerator, he thought, I'm going to freeze to death. He actually thought, I'm going to freeze to death and he wrote a message, I'm freezing to death. And the next morning when they came and opened the fridge, they found him dead. He would actually left the body. But the amazing thing was, the refrigerator wasn't cold. They turned off the refrigeration system. But in his mind, he was thinking that he's going to freeze to death. So it was because of his mind he died. And on the other hand, there was another person who was in a really bad accident and 
He broke so many bones in his body, he was covered in injuries, his whole body was bound up and he was in such a miserable condition. But he himself was like, oh, it's okay, I'll get better, no problem. Everyone else would come and see him and they'd think, oh my goodness, you know, oh, you're, you're lucky to be alive. And he'd say, oh yeah, yeah, I'll soon recover. And he did because he kept his mind very strong, that because of his mind, he was able to quickly recover and fight over his disease and get back to hell. So the mind can kill us and the mind can liberate us. It's up to us how we use the mind. We want to use the mind for the most important business, for the best things it can do. We should use the mind to cultivate our spiritual consciousness, Krishna consciousness. And we can do this very easily in the Kali Yuga, simply by chanting the holy name. Therefore, this Krishna consciousness movement is teaching everyone how to chant the holy name and how to cultivate this Krishna consciousness. Of course, just chanting the holy name is only a part of the process. There's more also involved. You want to cultivate Krishna consciousness. You should also read the books about Krishna. Just like we're speaking tonight from the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is only one book. There are other scriptures, many other scriptures. Generally, in our Krishna conscious centers, we will speak in the morning from the Srimad Bhagavatam and in the evening from the Bhagavad Gita. We see Bhagavad Gita has 18 chapters and in these 18 chapters there's a total of 700 slokas. So 700 slokas means if you just read one sloka a day, in less than two years, you can finish the whole Bhagavad Gita very easily. And it's very easy to read one sloka. Why only one sloka? If you read one chapter a day, then in 18 days you can finish the whole Bhagavad Gita. And once you've read the Bhagavad Gita one time, then read it again and read it again and just just keep reading it again and again because there's always more to be understood. This is the best way to use our mind, to use our mind to cultivate spiritual knowledge. And we get this spiritual knowledge from scriptures like Bhagavad Gita. And if we let our mind hear this knowledge and absorb this knowledge, and use our mind to think about the message of the Bhagavad Gita, then there's no opportunity for the mind to think about material sense gratification. You don't need to be thinking about material enjoyments. We can think about spiritual knowledge. Instead of thinking about just sense gratification, think about how to perform bhakti yoga. So that is the greatest, the great benefit we get from reading books like Bhagavad Gita and chanting Hare Krishna also. It's an opportunity to enrich our mind, to bring our mind out of the darkness, right? In the, in the Vedas it says, Tamasima Jatirgama says, Tamasima, don't stay in the dark. Come to the light, Jyotirgama, come to the light. We don't want to be in the darkness. There's only anxiety. There's no real happiness there in the dark. So we want to come to the light. And Krishna, where there is Krishna, that is light. Darkness is like maya or illusion. In the darkness of night, there's simply illusion. We're always worried and in anxiety. Who's coming? Maybe somebody's coming to kill me. Maybe somebody's coming, going to do harm to me. 
we're, we're, we're in fear, we're in so much anxiety. That is Maya. But when we're in Krishna consciousness, then we feel happy, we feel confident, we feel enthusiastic, we feel pleasure, spiritual bliss. That is actually the nature of the soul. The soul's nature is Satchit Ananda. It is eternal, it is full of knowledge and is full of bliss. We want to bring the mind to be conscious of our spiritual position, our spiritual nature, our spiritual identity. Don't allow the mind to dwell on the body. On the, the body is just the opposite of the soul. The body is temporary, ignorant and miserable. And that's what happens when we're in the bodily consciousness. We reflect that miserable condition. Therefore, Lord Krishna is saying, deliver yourself with the help of the mind. Don't degrade yourself. It's up to each and every individual how you're going to use your mind. Are you going to use it for your elevation or for your degradation? It's our choice. Lord Krishna gives us all free will. He does not force us. Just like in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna is speaking Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna. So then he says to Arjuna, all right, Arjuna, what are you going to do? Because Arjuna was in some confusion, should he take part in the battle or not? So our Lord Krishna says to him, he, he spoke the Bhagavad Gita and then he asked him, all right, now what are you going to do? Are you going to fight or not? It's, it's up to Arjuna to decide. In the same way, it's up to us. How are we going to use the mind? Are we going to use the mind for our improvement or for our bewilderment? We have that choice. We should make the proper choice how we can actually benefit ourselves. And the process which we are presenting here this evening is the chanting of the holy name. Now there are many holy names to chant. We chant the Hare Krishna mantra. You may like to chant the names of Lord Vishnu. You may like to chant other names. But we ourselves, we follow Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and we chant the holy name of Krishna. The holy name, it is said, Nam Chintamani Krishna. Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha, Purna Shuddha Nitya Mukto, Binat Nam Nama Namano. The holy name of Lord Krishna is like Chintamani. Chintamani means wish fulfilling. It can fulfill all of our spiritual desires. If we chant the holy name, of course we have to chant with feeling. It should not be done mechanically. We should chant from the heart, try to feel the presence of Lord Krishna in his name. Krishna is there, Krishna is his name and we can connect to Krishna through the chanting of his holy name. So we are requesting all of you this evening, try to chant the holy name, take shelter of the message of Lord Krishna. It's for your benefit. It's for our own benefit. We can all get the greatest op mercy, the greatest opportunity, but simply by this very simple exercise, chanting the holy name. Who's going to do it? It's up to everyone to decide. And when do you do it? The Lord Chaitanya said, there are no hard and fast rules in the chanting of the holy name. Now, someone may recommend things to you like, oh, you should chant in the morning. Someone may recommend like that. But actually, you can chant any time, any place, not only in the temple. You can chant any place. Even when you're taking your shower, you can chant the holy name. There are no rules in this chanting. There is the mercy of the Lord. 
And it's also His mercy that He has so many wonderful names which you can chant. And you can choose which names you would like to chant. Lord Chaitanya was very fond of chanting wonderful songs about Lord Krishna. And different names he would chant. He would sing, Hare Harai Nama Krishna Yadavaiha Namaha Gopal Govinda Ram Shri Madhusudan. Different names, you see, these are all different names of the Lord. Now you can chant any name. But remember, we are calling to the Lord. We want to develop our relationship with Him. We want to develop our love for Him. Yes, love. Love is for, for persons. And God is a person, just as we are persons, the Supreme Lord is also a person. And He has a plan. He wants us to come back to Him. He wants us to develop our relationship with Him. And that's why He came and spoke the Bhagavad Gita. And that's why we have so many temples everywhere and His deities are everywhere. We want everyone somehow to get an awakening to understand their lost relationship with the Lord Himself. And that will help us to control the mind. All right, we'll stop here. We'll ask if there are any questions. Anyone has any questions? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. My humble obeisances. Hare Krishna Prabhu. My obeisances. Guru Maharaj, uh, I have one question. Um, this is not with regards to uh, specifically to uh, the discussion today, but this is with uh, regards to chapter 13, Bhagavad Gita, verse 30. It says that um, uh, the Atma is, the, is, is not the doer. It's the basically, uh, you know, although interacting with the material body and everything, it's not the Atma who does the activities. Um, so from here, can we understand that it's actually the subtle body uh, controlled by the three modes, which is actually doing the activities and responsible for it? Uh, or is there a better understanding for that, Guru Maharaj? Uh, no, that's right. It, everything is... Uh, Krishna. Uh, Lord Krishna says, Prakriti Kriyamanani Gunai Karmani Sarvasha. Right? The bewildered spirit soul thinks himself to be the doer of activities which are actually carried out by the three modes of nature. But at the same time, the soul is the initiator of the action because it's the desire of the soul which brings about. The desire of the soul is facilitated through the material nature, it's sanctioned by the Lord and then facilitated through the material nature. The Lord is there in the heart as the super soul and he can understand the desire of the individual living entity. So these desires of the individual living entity, that's manifested or implemented but with the help of the Supreme Lord through the material nature. But it, the, the initial thing is actually the desire of the individual living entity. Although he's not actually the doer, he's not also, uh, he's not also, you can't say he wasn't responsible. He is responsible. We are responsible. Lord Krishna also says in the fifth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, I am not responsible for people's pious or sinful activities. They themselves, they are, we're all responsible for our activities. Now, we can't say the material nature did everything. We blame them, oh, I didn't do it, material nature did it. But why did the material nature do it? It did it because of the desire of the individual. The individual's desire influenced the material nature to act in a particular way. The modes of nature. Like that. Okay. Oh, also, Guru Maharaj, um, so when, when we perform activities, uh, as a result of those activities, we, sometimes we experience dualities, happiness, distress, or hurt. So can we say that these, these feelings are, 
are not experienced by the soul, but rather it's experienced by the uh, the mind and also the uh, false ego, the, the subtle body. Oh yes, yes exactly. Yes, the feelings which we consider like happiness and distress, friend and enemy. These are all just feelings coming from the mind. They're the illusion. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, there's the one verse where Sanatan, Lord Chaitanya is talking to Sanatan Goswami. He's telling that if we're thinking this is good or this is bad, that this is just the activities of the mind. He said, Dwait abhadra badragyan sab manodan, e bala, e manda, e sab brahm. He said, we're thinking this is good or this is bad. This is just our illusion. What is good for me may be bad for you. So we can't, it's not absolute. What I may think is very good, somebody else thinks is very bad. And I think somebody's my friend and somebody else thinks, you know, enemy. And so it's not absolute. And so this is the nature of the mind that we make these kind of, we have these kind of, we have this thinking, you know, I like this, I don't like that. But certainly this is not real truth. To actually come to the platform of real truth, we have to transcend the mind. We have to come to the higher platform. Okay. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. It's, it's a pleasure to meet you online also. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Thank you for your question. Yes. Any other question? Oh, here's someone. Vaishnavi's got a hand up. Vaishnavi Maharaji. Hare, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances on glory to Srila Prabhupada. Guru Maharaj, how to understand if it is the will of the Lord, whatever we do? Sometimes, yeah, we get some situations, we think, oh, because of my fault, it's happening or something. How do we know that we are working according to the will of the Lord? Well, we have sh Shastras are there, right? We have this, the Shastras telling us what is the Lord's plan, what the Lord wants, what is actually pleasing to the Lord. How do we know if it's actually... We, we could think ultimately everything which happens is sanctioned by the Lord. Now, everything which is san sanctioned by the Lord is it actually what he wants? Well, what does the Lord really want? He wants all of us to come back to him. He wants us to surrender to him. The Lord wants us to become his devotees, like that. That's what he really wants. So all, all of the other things which happen, they may just be the arrangements of the Lord to bring us to that position. The, the difficulties which we undergo, the, the problems which come and the things which go wrong, we have to just simply accept that this is, somehow this is Krishna's arrangement. Just like sometimes somebody may be a very good devotee. There, may, there was one time Srila Prabhupada had this one devotee. He was a very good devotee and Prabhupada had big plans for using him in Krishna consciousness. He was going to do a lot of preaching with this one devotee. But then some, somehow this man died. And Prabhupada understood. So he, said, what, he said, this is somehow Krishna's plan. We have to simply accept that this is the will of Krishna. We have to tolerate and go on with the situation. So it's, we, don't un, we don't really know what is Krishna's plan, but whatever, everything which happens to us, a devotee understands that this is somehow Krishna's arrangement. Just like a, when a devotee meets with something bad, something which is really, you know, which they, we, we really didn't want and we didn't like, 
when we think that this is my karma, we think this is some reactions due to my past activities. And Krishna is just giving me a token punishment for my past activities. Right? The, 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 that verse is there in the Srimad Bhagavatam that uh, one who tolerates all kinds of difficulties but goes on with his devotional service, then he becomes my honorable devotee. We have to accept the difficulties which come, that we think, a devotee will think, these are reactions due to my past, but a devotee will also think that whatever reactions I'm getting, they're being minimized by the grace of Krishna. And a devotee will think, I'm meant to suffer much more, but Lord Krishna is reducing the suffering. And sometimes when things go very well for us and we're getting very good results, then the devotee will also think that this is the arrangement of Krishna, that actually I'm not meant to get such good results, but Krishna is just trying to encourage me. So in this way a devotee sees everything as the arrangement of Krishna, the good and the bad. We see ultimately it's all Krishna's doing. And, it, and it's according to my qualification and some way. The, the, the sufferings are, you know, it's my fault. We take the suffering. And when the result's very good, we think, I don't deserve it. Krishna's just trying to encourage me. So we always see the mercy of Krishna in every situation. The bad situation, we're thinking Krishna is very merciful, he's only giving, given me a, a little suffering. I'm only getting a little reaction. I deserve to suffer much more. I'm such a rascal. I should be punished much more. But Krishna's minimized the reactions. And when it's good, we don't deserve it. So we have to, we have to see things. And this is a Krishna conscious vision the devotee, we see things in this way. We see the hand of Krishna in everything. Yes, Guru Maharaj, thank you so much. Guru Maharaj, I was also wondering about the suffering of Sanatana Goswami. Uh, how to take this Guru Maharaj? Because they, they are not uh, ordinary souls like us. So he suffered so much. Uh, he has to escape from the jail and has to get the skin disease. Uh, uh, like how to take this Guru Maharaj? Is, it a, is, is there a teaching for us? or? Well, we have to understand that not, not everything is always so easy for us. There will be difficulties in the life. There are going to be problems. There are going to be difficulties. And we have to meet with them when they come. We, we understand, you know, that these are all reactions due to our past, but we tolerate them and go on with them. And so Sanatana Goswami, of course, he was a very, very elevated, pure soul, and he suffered. Just like the Pandavas, they suffered also. Why do they suffer? Why do these great devotees suffer? They're teaching us how we should react when we have difficulties, how we have to be tolerant and how we have to say, we have to stay very strong in consciousness of Lord Krishna in every situation. So Sanatana Goswami's problems, it gave an opportunity for Lord Chaitanya to speak about actually the body of the pure devotee Lord Chaitanya explained that, that he, he said to Sanatana, he said, you're just like my child. He said, so when, when I embrace you, I feel nectar. I don't feel the poison. I don't feel discomfort. He said, it's just like nectar. But then Lord Chaitanya also embraced him and, and took away all the disease. And Sanatana Goswami was cured by the grace of Lord Chaitanya. 
So pastime, you could say this is Lila, this is pastime. Lord Chaitanya is teaching us through his pure devotees, like Sanatan, that you have to expect there will be difficulties, there will be problems, there will be suffering. You have to tolerate it and you have to maintain Krishna consciousness. All right, Queen Kunti said all the difficulties help her to remember Lord Krishna more and more. Maybe difficulties, it may not be difficulty, it may be all joy, it may be all successes and rejoicing, but we should see it all as the mercy of Krishna. Just like the devotees in Prabhupada's time, they did a very successful program. And after the program, they all gathered together and the devotees were so confident and one devotee exclaimed to Prabhupada, he said, oh, we did it, Prabhupada, we did it, this was really great. And Prabhupada looked at him and said, we didn't do anything, Krishna did it. So we have to see the hand of Krishna. Give the credit to Krishna if everything goes well. And if it doesn't go well, then we take the blame. Right? If, the, if you cook very nicely, it's the mercy of Krishna. And if you don't cook nicely, then it's your fault. <laughs> you have to take the blame. This is the Krishna conscious mood of a devotee. Shilpa Maharaji has a question. Yes, Guru Maharaj Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Guru Maharaj, I wanted to understand um, the desire we, the individual soul, we have the desire. And so what's the relationship between our desire and our mind? Or is there any relationship or no? Well, there are many desires which come in the mind. That generally that's a function of the mind, desire. And the desires will come in different phases, different, uh, uh, how to say, some desires will be very strong. It begins with thinking. We start thinking, we desire something, think about it. And then you have, the next stage is feeling that you have a stronger desire. And then when it comes to the willing stage, well, I have to have this. And then when you get to the willing stage, then you're going to go and do it, right? So the desire, it's not desire anymore, it becomes an action. I'm going off, I have to go and buy it, I have to go and get this, or I have to go and sell this, or whatever. And so these are different, this is the different uh, stages of desire. Thinking, feeling, and willing. When it comes to the willing stage, you can't stop it, you have to do it. But if you're still thinking and feeling, you haven't quite decided about it, but once you get to the willing stage, then you can't stop it. So these desires come in the mind, they come, come and go. We have, but the ultimate, what, what we should desire is for the service of Krishna. We shouldn't just desire simply for the satisfaction of the body. We want to desire for the satisfaction of Lord Krishna, how to please Krishna. So we think about our Krishna consciousness. What is good for my Krishna consciousness? We don't just think what is good for my senses or what is good for my ego, but we think what is actually good? What does Krishna want? What does Krishna want me to do? What will Krishna be happy with me? When will Krishna be happy with me? What should I, what do I need to do to please him? So like that, try to put Krishna in the center, in our mind. We fix our mind on Krishna and then think how to please Krishna. So the person, you know, those things we're thinking in our mind, the people who are dear to us, we think how to please them. So we want to keep Krishna there in our mind and think how to please him. When we cook, we cook for Krishna. When you clean, you clean for Krishna. We do everything for Krishna. Thank so, you, Guru Mahal. 
So the intelligence guides the desires. Higher than the mind is the intelligence. Intelligence it will help us to discriminate what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And so we need to, to cultivate good intelligence to control the mind. And so that's why we have to read and chant. And that will give us more intelligence to help us to control these desires. We'll understand, oh, this desire is really wrong, I should stop this desire, I have to get, how to get rid of the desire? You simply turn to Krishna and call out to Krishna, oh Krishna, save me, right? You call out to Krishna and Krishna, you know, you, you just turn to the holy name, you grab your bead bag, pick up your beads and start chanting, or you pick up the Bhagavad Gita or something and you start reading. And that way you get, get, take your mind away from the, the evil, from the maya, from the illusion of material life by turning to Krishna. Mm. So intelligence help us, you know, that I, sh well, I shouldn't be desiring like this. I have to use my intelligence to stop that, change that desire. The mind, nature of the mind book has to think, has to contemplate something. So we have to stop it from contemplating the illusion of material life. And we have to bring the mind to think about devotional life, bhakti yoga, how to serve Krishna. So practice is practice, constantly dealing with our mind. One of our devotees, he was describing japa, he said, uh, we're, we're training our gladiators. You know, gladiators, they were the Roman soldiers, you know, the great Roman soldiers, they were gladiators and they could fight lions, you know, they'd go in the jungle with swords, sometimes they'd go in the arena and they'd fight lions. Recording stopped. So, the, the he said, we're, we're training our gladiators to conquer the mind in the arena of japa, right? By doing good chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra, we will conquer over the mind. Bring the mind away. Don't let the mind stay in the garbage, you know, the, the crows are always in the garbage. So, be like the swan, cultivate the mind to become like a swan, bring it to Krishna, to thoughts of Krishna. So we have to, that's why you have to read and chant and we have to think about what we're reading and understand it, contemplate it. That's the proper use of the mind. Savaimana Krishna, Maharaj Ambarish was doing bhakti, he was doing yoga, he was a great devotee. So it said about Maharaj Ambarish, Savaimana Krishna Padara Vindayor, Vachamsi Vaikuntha Gunarna Varnane. Maharaj Ambarish, he, he did all the different kinds of yoga, different kinds of devotion. But the very first thing he did was to engage the mind at the lotus feet of Krishna. The most important thing, fix the mind on Krishna and then the senses will engage in the service of Krishna. So Maharaj Ambarish, he was using all of his senses. He was using his hands to clean the temple and his tongue to chant the holy name and to taste prasadam and his eyes to see the deity and his legs to walk to the holy places, and his nose to smell the flowers offered to the deities. Everything was, all the different senses were being used for Krishna. But the first thing, the mind is fixed on the lotus feet of Krishna. So very important, get the mind under control, bring it to Krishna. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. All right. Is, is this another question here? Guru Maharaj, I have one more question. Oh, yes, Surashankar. Okay, 
Uh, Guru Maharaj, um, I've read somewhere that uh, one of the ways to uh, remove fear from the heart is by meditating on the lotus feet of the Lord. And just now you also mentioned uh, we should fix our mind on the lotus feet of the Lord. Uh, what does it practically mean, fixing the mind on the lotus feet of the Lord? Does it mean that I imagine or remember the, the, the image of the feet of the deity? or Is there any esoteric meaning in that? Can you explain it much? Well, there are many different ways you can approach the lotus feet of the Lord. Of course, you can visualize the Lord's lotus feet and you can also, uh, within your mind, you can think of the different marks which are there on the lotus feet of the Lord, the auspicious markings on his lotus feet. And we can simply, uh, we, we can also think of the uh, the holy places, because the holy places also represent the lotus feet. By by going to the holy places, you're you're taking shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord, because the Lord resides in the holy places and He walks in there in the holy places. So, if you're in thinking of the holy places, then you're also in the shelter of the Lord's lotus feet. And we could say, actually, there's no difference between the Lord's lotus feet and His lotus face. It's all absolute. But generally, when we come to the Lord, we should meditate first on His lotus feet. We should look down, because He's the greatest personality. So we come before Him in a humble manner, and we look down towards the feet, and then gradually look up. So... You can do it mentally, or you can do it visually. And you can look at the deity, you can look at a photo of the Lord, you can, and you can think of the Lord's lotus feet. And you can think of some markings also there on his lotus feet. And either way, the, the, the point is that mood of humility and submission to the Lord. Not just simply the, oh, the Lord's lotus feet. It's not just touching the feet, but the, the idea is submission to the Lord. That He is my master, I am His servant. Just like when Akrura went to Vrindavan and he was bringing Krishna and Balaram to Mathura. So when Akrura got to Vrindavan and he saw the footprints of Lord Krishna on the ground, he, he jumped off his chariot and he rolled in the dust and he exclaimed, This is the dust from the lotus feet of my master. <laughs> so he was, this was his ecstasy. This was uh, Akrura's ecstasy. He said, This is the dust from the feet of my master. And he was rolling in the dust. <laughs> so he, he, he was thinking like that, that the Lord is his master. So that this should be the mood. He's, the Lord is my master, I'm his servant. That's the idea of approaching the lotus feet. We come as a servant. Yeah? Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Krishna. Okay, so, oh, oh, Jolene has a, a question. Jolene? Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. Um, I am wondering if there are demons among the human society or it's only that the human have demonic nature. Are there demons among the human society? Do you consider humans who are who don't control their mind? Recording stopped. Demons or demonic? Well, uh, from Bhagavad Gita, we learn there are two kinds of living entities. There's the divine, the, the godly, and the, there's the demoniac, the asuras. The, there's the, as, the suras and the asuras. The suras, <coughs> the suras are the godly, and the asuras are the demoniac. Recording in progress. So, among human society, certainly, <laughs> there are demons, yes. 
In the world there are demons, there are many demons, and there are also devotees. Both are there. Both those who are demons can also become devotees. That's a po an important point. When someone's a demon doesn't mean they have to remain a demon. They can become a devotee also. Now we do see also that people like Prahlad Maharaj was born in a demoniac family, but he was a great devotee. Although his, he was born among the demons and, and the, fa the father was a great demon, and they, were, and they were rulers of the demons, but he was a great devotee. And similarly, Bali Maharaj was also a devotee, although he was, he was the grandson of Prahlad. And he was also, so he's also born in the demon family, but he was a devotee. Now, even those people who are demons, like in the battle of Kurukshetra, uh, we read about Duryodhana and Dhritarashtra, and they're really, you know, they're not nice people. They're not nice people. But Prabhupada also remarks in one purport, he said, you know, he's talking about Dhritarashtra, actually. He said that he must have been a great soul because he was born in the in the the dynasty where Lord Krishna appeared. He was born there, he was able to be involved in Lord Krishna's pastimes. So although he was a demon here in this world, it doesn't mean that he's a demon eternally. It can just simply be a role which he is playing for the pastimes of Lord Krishna. And we see Putana. Mother, you know, the witch Putana who came to poison baby Krishna, Lord Krishna took her to his abode, to the spiritual world. He took her into Goloka Vrindavan to become one of the nurses there. Although she was, you know, she was a real witch and she killed many baby children. But Lord Krishna took her back to Godhead. So, uh... <laughs> It's difficult to know, you know, who is who is the demon, <laughs> how to judge. Somebody may be a demon in, in this life, but they may actually be a great devotee in the spiritual world. Do you understand, Jolene? Yes, uh, thank you, Guru Maharaj. It's, it's a very good explanation. Okay, so thank you very much for the question. All right, so we'll, I think we'll finish here. Very kind of you all to listen and have questions. Hare Krishna.